This is Stanley McGorkle, a man with a great stake in America's oil industry. Not just to keep his razor humming, either. Stanley, like all of us, lives in a world which depends on oil and oil products. Oil is essential to the farm machinery which harvests Stanley's food, and the trucks which bring it to market. The diesel trains which carry the commerce of the nation and the planes which carry Stanley's mail depend on oil. Oil power ships plying the sea lanes to and from ports all over the world. Oil supplies power and lubrication for a multitude of America's industries. It is the lifeblood of national defense, helping to protect the freedom of all Americans, including Stanley McGorkle. Which, by the way, brings up the thought of what it might be like if the McGorkle family had to do without oil. No lubrication. No electric shave. If they are made from oil products, no toothbrushes. No cosmetics. No nylons. Without oil for the furnace, everything in the house gets the shivers and shakes. Little Oswald's plastic spaceship may be made from an oil product. The wheels on Brother Lorenzo's scooter add their clattering complaint for oil, like every other wheel in the house. The paint on Stanley's house may have an oil-based thinner. Without oil-based weed killers, the lawn looks like a place for Stanley to meet Livingston. Of course, there are other kinds of weed killers, but they need oil too. Oh well, he can always take a little drive to get away from it all. Or can he? Without oil, there would be no asphalt road. No gasoline for fuel. No cold rubber tires. As a matter of fact, no motor. And if the fabric in Stanley's pants is made from oil products, look out, brother. Of course, other items of apparel might be made from oil products, too. No doubt about it, Stanley and all of us have quite a stake in an ample supply of oil. Now, just where does oil come from? It doesn't grow in those little cans. Or even in those huge storage tanks. Some people think oil flows underground like a river. It doesn't. Others think it lies in deep pools just waiting to be tapped. Wrong again. Instead, isolated by faults and wrinkles in the Earth's crust, trapped beneath layers of rock, packed under tremendous pressures in sands and porous limestone, usually mixed with gas, we find the liquid of modern man's progress. This is oil. And this is an oil well. 
Now, contrary to some beliefs, the oil well is nothing like a water well. The oil operator can't keep on dipping out oil indefinitely for one very important reason. It would have to rain oil to replenish the underground supply. And unfortunately, it never rains oil. When an oil deposit is used up, like an ice cream soda, that's all there is. There isn't any more. And all oil wells go dry eventually. So the big problem is to keep enough new wells being drilled to replace the ones that dry up. Each year, the oil industry spends hundreds of millions of dollars in its search for nature's miracle liquid. First, operators must have the money to employ the latest scientific methods and instruments to help them locate possible oil-bearing formations. This equipment might be regarded as the bloodhound of the oil industry. If a property looks good, the operator must invest in leases and pay annual rentals, and then spend more money to prepare drilling locations. It takes still more money to purchase expensive tools and equipment, and to pay the skilled labor that builds the derricks and drills for oil. Once drilling starts, costs mount rapidly. A 5,000-foot well may cost more than $50,000, a 10,000-foot well may cost over $200,000, and a 15 to 20,000-foot well may cost $500,000 to a million dollars or more. Most shallow fields have already been discovered, so deep drilling is standard practice today. Of course, where wells are more difficult to drill, their costs may run into several millions. But in spite of the money and effort spent on a well, there is still no guarantee that oil will be found by the slender tube boring beneath the Earth's surface. And unfortunately, it costs just as much to drill a dry hole as it does a producing well. Now, what are the operator's odds on finding any oil at all in exploratory drilling? One in nine. His chance of breaking even on his investment is one in 44. And his chance of hitting the jackpot the discovery of a major oil field is one in 991. Yet this operator and thousands like him keep on drilling for oil. Why? Well, it wasn't always this way. In 1918, Congress was shocked to learn that the level of our oil reserves was dropping at an alarming rate. Discoveries of oil were lagging behind consumption at the same time, oil operators, corporations, and individuals were afraid to risk their money to drill enough new wells. The odds were just too high. Congress couldn't change the odds, but it did a lot of research on the problem, and in 1926, it came up with a plan which it called percentage depletion. This plan recognized the fact that oil production was an extractive industry. That is, one which was constantly using up an exhaustible supply of raw materials. Now, coal mining, like oil production, is also an extractive industry. The operator, in extracting his product, is getting some of his capital back. However, his supply of raw materials will be exhausted in time. Therefore, percentage depletion basically allows the operator to deduct from every dollar of income received from the mine 10 cents, which will be free from federal income taxes. Considering that the risks are so great in finding and producing oil, percentage depletion allows the operator of a producing well to deduct from every dollar of income from the well 27 and a half cents, which will be free from federal income taxes. However, there are limitations in the law which usually reduce this amount. After the operator pays wages and operating expenses, the Treasury Department will collect taxes on the remainder of his income. Of course, the oil industry will pay full taxes on all other operations, such as refining, transportation, and marketing. In subsequent years, Congress applied the same principle of percentage depletion to many other extractive industries.
such as sulfur mining, gold mining, granite quarrying, seashell dredging, and many more. It was designed as an incentive for these industries to take the risks in finding new deposits of raw materials. For instance, when an oil well ran dry, the operator had a choice of reinvesting his money in the risky business of oil drilling or getting into a more conservative enterprise. Percentage depletion would offer him an incentive to continue spending his money in hunting for oil in spite of the odds. This plan apparently looked good to oil operators, corporations, and individual investors. For gradually, more money began to flow into new well drilling. In 1926, the oil deposits we discovered were estimated at 8 billion barrels. These were our oil reserves. They were enough for a 13 year supply at the 1926 rate of consumption of 2 million barrels daily. Since then, consumption has risen to some 8 million barrels a day. However, since Congress established percentage depletion, exploratory drilling of wells in many locations, including states which were once thought to be barren of oil, has brought about the discovery of great new oil deposits. Technological progress in the oil industry has developed new methods of recovering oil from old wells. For example, in the water flooding process, water is pumped into old wells to free the oil particles adhering to the sand in the limestone, washing them toward the producing wells. This further increases our supply of this essential product from fields which might otherwise have been abandoned. In 1926, our reserves were 8 billion barrels. Since that time, our reserves have increased to more than four times that amount. The efficiency of the oil industry's labor and management has kept pace with the years. For instance, comparing the gasoline of today with that of 25 years ago, we find that today's gasoline is of much better quality, yet costs about the same before taxes as it did in 1926, despite the fact that the cost of drilling a well has increased 400% since that time. Large reserves have helped to keep prices down on all oil products. Scientists and engineers, assured of ample reserves, have touched oil with the magic wand of multi-million dollar research programs to transform it into everything from tires to tablecloths, from varnish to vanishing cream, and countless other products to contribute to a more pleasurable life for all of us. This increased productivity has helped to build a strong and profitable oil industry with a return on investment over the years that has been no higher than that of other major American industries. And the oil industry bears its fair share of the tax load at local, state, and federal levels to make it one of the nation's largest taxpayers. For more than 25 years, successive Congresses have re-examined percentage depletion and have re-approved it as an essential part of an essential industry. While we have adequate reserves now, new uses for oil are being developed every day. In the near future, we will be increasing our rate of consumption from 8 million to 10 million barrels a day. The increasing demand for oil means that more areas must be explored, more money invested to drill more wildcat wells, more new major fields discovered. Percentage depletion has helped to maintain an ample reserve of oil in the past. It can do the same in the future to give us enough oil to supply the energy and lubrication to keep the wheels of America turning so that Stanley McGorkle and all of us and travel forward on the road of progress.